All right, well, let's uh, go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Jekinowski, and uh, I'm with the World Agricultural Outlook Board. And this session is uh, foreign production, trade, and import export data. Um, so uh, I'm joined today again. I'm with uh, with the World Board, and I'm joined with joined by uh, Patrick Packnet of FAS and Joe DeCampo of Census. And uh, this session, uh, as we've done for the past um, few times we've held this session. Uh, we view this as, as really just a, an open Q&A. Um, we find that most people who come to this session, uh, you know, they're um, uh, heavy users of the data. They, they, um, uh, they, they come, with the, uh, come with their questions uh, ready to go. And, 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 and we, we or, and or our staff, uh, members of our staff are also on the call. Uh, we'll hopefully be able to, uh, to to answer answer your questions. So, the way this works, if you recall, um, uh, all of the participants, uh, you're muted, but you can submit your questions over the Q and A, um, and we will um, uh, respond to those questions as they come in. Um, so, with that, just a Brief introduction. Uh, maybe uh, each of us uh, panelists can give a brief introduction of, about uh, who we are. Again, I'm I'm Mark Jekinowski, so I'm chairman of the World Agricultural Outlook Board. Uh, the World Board, if you as you know, if you attended the uh, agency review session just uh, uh, last hour, uh, we are responsible responsible for putting out the World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates. Um, so we're, we work closely with FAS. And we rely on census for trade data as well. Um, and uh, I'm joined today by several of our uh, world board staff and, and uh, uh, several of the ICEC chairs uh, and uh, hopefully able to answer your questions. Um, Patrick and Joe, you guys want to say a few words? Uh, yes, thanks, Mark. Again, I'm Patrick Packnett. I'm the Deputy Administrator uh, in the Global Market Analysis Program area of FAS. Uh, and as I mentioned uh, earlier at the first session, um, we bring the foreign component to the uh, USDA supply and demand estimates process, as uh, Mark mentioned, and you know, helping out with the WASD. Uh, we are responsible for our uh, commodity reporting from our overseas offices, uh, as well as the export sales report uh, in over 60 monthly biannual uh, commodity circulars each year, um, in addition to maintaining the PSD database that you find on our FAS website, as well as the GATS database, which um, we use to uh, house the uh, data that we get from census. Uh, I too have a number of, um, of my managers and staff uh, from FAS um, and, and also in you know global market analysis program area where I work. So I'll turn it over to uh, Joe. Uh, hello, I am Joe DeCampo, section supervisor over foods and textiles, both import and export for the U.S. Census Bureau. And uh, of course, we gather that data from Customs and Border Protection, and then that goes into our monthly uh, FT900 report. All right, thank you, Bye. Joe. Thank you, Patrick. And um, now let's uh, open it up to, uh, to all of you participants. Um, the Q&A is open, uh, so uh, go ahead and uh, type in any questions you might have, and uh, we would be happy to try to shed some light on them. Hey, Mark, uh, yeah. while, while we wait, uh, there was a question from the morning session from Joseph Lardy. Um, I can read that question and try to answer it uh, while we wait for uh, questions from the other participants, if you'd like. Good. Uh, so uh, Mr. Lardy writes, Mr. Packnett, why do we get two separate sets of export inspection data 
one set comes out on Monday, and then the next set comes out on Thursday. Uh, which one is the version that eventually equals the USDA export figure on the WASD? Um, so it's an interesting question. Um, I'll take a stab at that. Mark might want to chime in or, or others. But um, FAS does not issue inspection data. Uh, the FAS data that comes out on Thursday is from our export sales report. Uh, that data is reported to us by law by the exporters. Uh, we then compile that data over the course of the week and issue a report on Thursday. Uh, the data that you may be referring to on Monday would be the AMS inspection data, um, which um, we're not responsible for in FAS, but that's uh, the actual data of you know, commodity that are inspected and on the ship and, and being exported. Um, I don't think either of those numbers by themselves uh, would necessarily equal the, the export number in the WASD. However, they are both key inputs uh, that our staff looks at uh, in arriving at what would be the export um, estimate that we have that would go in the WASD. So, um, that was that question, Mark. I'm not sure if you want to add anything to that. Uh, no, Patrick, I think uh, that's right. They start, they both inform the WASD, um, uh, the, the process, the, those uh, forecasts that go into each month. Um, Keith or Mike, you guys want to say a word or two about how you, um, you know, uh, how you use inspections and why you track inspections and, and how you use um, uh, export sales. Sure, I, I can start. We, we use both yeah. of those as indicators uh, for tracking what will ultimately be the official export number, which is the census provided number for exports. So inspections gives us a heads up, export sales gives us a heads up. Both of them, well, in particular inspections has reasons that they don't necessarily inspect everything. So they're not, ex you wouldn't anticipate that they would line up exactly with the final census export number, um, but they do give us a lot of guidance along the way, Mike. Uh, nothing to add to that except for corn. The other important uh, caveat, as you mentioned, Keith, is they don't line up uh, completely. And part of the reason for that on corn in particular is uh, truck and rail shipments to Canada and Mexico are not required by law to be inspected. So uh, it's no. one of the reasons why it doesn't line up very well for corn, at least relative to sense. Yes. Uh, one other thing, they're not required to uh, report every single, they don't have to inspect every single container. There's a uh, limit on the amount they have to inspect. So to the extent there's shipped by container, not all of those are inspected. So that's another reason why you could have a, a difference. All right, great. Thank you guys. Um, Patrick, did you say you had another uh, question from this morning? We have one in the in in the Q and A, but yeah, if you had another one from uh, from earlier from the earlier session, let's uh, do that one first. Yeah, um, there was a question from Jerry Goodell. Uh, he asked, "When is FAS going to release its October sign-up data?" Uh, and I, I really need more clarification on what exactly uh, that question is because we don't have sign up data. Uh, so I, I think we need clarification on that one, which might be provided later. So perhaps we can go on and take the question that's in the chat in the Q&A box now. I'm okay. come back to this one. Good. Let's go ahead and do that. And um, so I'll read this uh, question for the group. And um, uh, Mike, uh, you should maybe uh, uh, think about uh, responding on this one. So this is a question from Karen Braun from Reuters. Uh, last year, there was a lot of noise about USDA's China corn import forecast being too low, but the defense at the time was the TRQ limits. Obviously, USDA has bypassed that 
as the forecast far surpasses those quotas, which were recently set again at the same levels as previous years. What official rule now allows USDA to bypass those TRQ restrictions and issue a higher trade forecast? Okay, great question, Karen. Um, so uh, I guess you could start and you could back up. Since the WTO accession, it was generally, people generally agreed that that was a constraint in terms of policy uh, that would uh, at least limit imports beyond the 7.2 million tons. Uh, in the empirical world, we react to the data, right? So the empirical data said uh, it's going to exceed that. And I would also add there, there's some caveats too. Re recall that NDRC roughly around this time a year ago, perhaps it was a little earlier, I seem to recall September, they actually issued an announcement that said we're not issuing any additional quota for calendar year 20 or 21. Um, and we've seen recently uh, this year, the same announcement, but the empirical data says the TRQ is no longer a constraint. So again, in the empirical world or react to the data, the data says the TRQ is not a constraint for corn. Appreciate the question. Good. Thanks, Mike. Um, another question just came in. Uh, this is probably for Patrick. Um, if you can see it. So should we expect any reporting delays from FAS as there may be an increased employee turnover rate due to vaccination requirements for the federal government employees? Uh, interesting question. Uh, I'm not anticipating um, any delays in our reporting due to vaccine requirements. Um, at the moment, you know, we're in a maximum telework status and uh, since the pandemic, um, we've been able to issue all of our reports on time. Uh, nothing so far has uh, prevented us from doing it. I don't anticipate the vaccine requirements would be an issue for us, but, um, you know, if we have issues, then we'll, you know, do our best to work around them and ensure that we continue to issue our, issue our data um, on time. Good. Um, and Patrick, if you can see in the q and it looks like your uh, the question from Jerry Goodell, he actually he transposed maybe FAS with FSA. He was re referring to FSA certified acreage uh, in, his, in his question. Right. So, uh, right. And maybe one of uh, your folks from the board might be able to speak to that because um, I'm, I'm not familiar with the certified acreage data. And so remind me again, what was the question, Patrick, when, it, when uh, it's going to be released or? Right, for October. Oh. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, Mike or Keith, do you guys know about release, uh, release schedules for the FSA data? Maybe I believe Lance is, in, Lance is in the chat. I, that's. He's referring to certified acreage. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't have anything to add on that unless you did. Um, it has been, okay. Um, Lance oh. just in, put in the chat has been delayed. Okay. Thanks, Lance. Good. All right. Um, all right. Another question just came through here. Uh, I'm not sure if this is for. Patrick or for um, Mark Simone or some combination of both. So is it possible in the future to get data on wheat by class for international data? For example, Australia, Canada, HRW, uh, HRS, SRW, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, that's, that's a good question. I, I guess I would say I would doubt it, but um, I do have uh, some of uh, my team on the call who might be able to speak to whether or not we have any idea about, you know, wheat classes or, or we're probably just looking at wheat in total uh, for foreign production.
Ron, do either you or Bob want to have anything to add to that? Or maybe even anybody from the board? All right. Hi, Patrick, this is Bob. Uh, we don't have that information for a week by class um, for foreign countries. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, so basically, essentially, that data does not exist. Um, and it would be, therefore, hard to estimate. Um, okay, here's a, another question. Is there documentation for how the World Board uses FAS and census data for final trade estimates in the WASD? Um, documentation. I, uh, I don't believe we have any formal documentation. Um, uh, Mike or Keith, you guys want to talk through that process just a bit? Um, I guess I just formal documentation on how we use FAS or census data. We take census data uh, for soybean for fine, code yeah. 1201, four digit, um, as the final estimate at this point. I don't think cotton necessarily uses census, but the rest of us, I think, do various maybe compilations of codes, but in general, we just use the census data as our official data. I don't think there's any documentation for the final requiring data, right. that or anything. Right. No, uh, and I would just what echo what Keith said. Uh, it, generally speaking, it's the across the board for mo most commodities. Obviously, cotton is an exception. We would we would utilize the census data. So. Right. All right. Um, Let's see another question. A uh, couple coming in now. Um, Ryan Nielsen with uh, uh, Brugler Marketing. Uh, for 2020 2021 soybeans, census bean exports summed to uh, 2.265 billion bushels, matches the October WASDI. Uh, CAIR fats and oils, that's the NAS report, summed to 2.1404 billion bushels. Uh, so to get to NASA's count, 256 ending stocks, where did the minus 3 million bushel residual come from? Any inclination on where it may go and how frequently have beans had a negative residual after the September 30 report. Uh, Keith, can you, uh, can you see the question? I can Keith? answer that. Okay, good, yeah. yeah. The arithmetic for, we get beginning stocks, imports from census, production from NAS, we get uh, crush from NAS, we get exports from census, we get ending stocks from, uh, we, we get ending stocks from NAS, we make an estimate of seed use, and then we break out residual. That's just the way the arithmetic goes this year at this point. Not to say there won't be data revisions coming in the future. Uh, there were numerous adjustments to exports this year through December. Census, nothing to say there wouldn't be. I don't know that there would be, but the difference between census and inspections this year is bigger than normal. Uh, there has really, at the single digit level, not been a negative residual in the past. There is one year, I can't remember the exact one, where there's something a little bit less than 0 0.5 negative, just the way the data turned out. So wouldn't consider that to be in any sense use. It's just an accumulation of various 
statistical errors or whatever you might say in reporting and that's that, and then NAS, maybe someone from NAS can explain a little bit how they take all of this data at the end of the year and then assess how to make crop adjustments. That would be really all I'd have to say to it. All right, good. Thanks, Keith. Um, Patrick, it looks like a next few questions here might be for uh, you or someone on, on your team. Um, Don Close of uh, Robo AgriFinance. Given the explosive growth in beef exports to China, what is the long-term view of those shipments? Um, so you got someone from your group if and or maybe shale? Um, it's a good question. Um, I don't know if uh, Lindsay, Lindsay Kaburka is on the call. I'm not sure if you want to speak to that or if we want to defer to the board. Um, what are your thoughts, Lindsay? I don't see shale here. Um, oh, okay. So, but I guess uh, we don't, we don't have a bilateral trade forecast, so we don't explicitly forecast what U.S. exports to China will be, um, but we have seen explosive growth in, in beef exports to China this year. Um, and we continue to see very strong demand in China. So of course we're, I think, pretty optimistic about continued growth in that market. Um, China's the biggest beef market and still a lot of demand there. Um, I think looking at next year, the, the only thing that would give me pause is that we've got lower US beef production in 2022. So perhaps higher prices and, and maybe some, some headwinds. But um, overall, we see China as a strong growth market for beef. Thank you very much, Lindsay. It's a great answer. Uh, I would also just uh, reiterate, we don't do bilateral, but in general, the, we have our baseline projections, which go 10 years out, and we'll have a new one coming out in February. We'll have our general outlook on some of the import projections for US or for US and China. Good. Thanks, David. Good point. Um, uh, Patrick, it looks like the next one uh, question is for you as well. Can you do you want to read it and uh, okay and... I I will. Um, Karen from Reuters, uh, can you retouch on the loss of the Moscow attache? That went by quickly in the intro session, but it seems like a big deal. Is there any timeline as to when that might be reestablished? And what are the biggest challenges that now exist when putting together S&D tables for Russia? Where are the biggest information gaps? So um, why don't I generally comment on the first part uh, and then um, uh, perhaps, uh, I don't know if the board wants to talk about um, kind of how we're going to approach um, sort of S&Ds for, for Russia, um, given the, the loss of the attache reports. But um, I guess the simple answer is we don't know. We don't have a timeline. Um, and I really don't have insights into the kind of the U.S.-Russia diplomatic discussions and uh, and when those relationships might um, uh, be improved uh, to a point that allows our uh, diplomatic presence to be restored. So hopefully it will be soon. Um, as I mentioned um, uh, in the session this morning, you know, we're looking at all um, available data and options that we have uh, at our disposal to understand that market. Uh, and to continue to do um, good um, supply and demand estimates. Um, we do have our, um, you know, our satellite imagery, uh, weather data, uh, we have trade data, uh, and there are probably other sources of information uh, that our analysts have access to coming out of um, Russia that um, uh, could be used. Uh, so I'll stop there and see if others want to chime in. Good, thanks, Patrick. Um, let's see, uh, Mike and or Mark Simone, you guys have any uh, any additional thoughts 
on dealing with the loss of information from Russia? Uh, I would just, Patrick hit most of the key points. Uh, keep in mind that nothing, it, obviously it helps to have an attache presence. We don't, we don't have it for every single country in the world. Uh, that doesn't mean that we can't come up with objective unbiased estimates for the various commodities that are important for that country. Um, and, and obviously uh, Russia is a, a key player, not just in the, in the wheat world, but in the coarse grain world. Um, so you do your best with the tools that you got and not having an attache, yeah, that hurts, but that doesn't mean we can't uh, provide uh, uh, reliable estimates for that country. Very good, thanks, Mike. Um, all right, um, more questions. Uh, go ahead and get them in there if, uh, if 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 you have any any that are um, burning for you. We we we've we ran through all of the ones that have been submitted so far. So we'll uh, give a give a few minutes in case there are additional ones, if you're thinking of them or uh, want to take some time to uh, gather your thoughts. Um, but again, this is, uh, this is your session and your opportunity to, to hear from us. Okay, uh, here's one, okay, this, is, this one is for us, just came through. Uh, uh, Dave Busios, you might, uh, you might be able to answer this one. On what date will the early tables be published for the long-term projections? Recently, it has been late October. Um, sorry, I'm confirming. I want, we're putting, we're putting out a press release October 26th, and it'll be the following Thursday that the tables will be released. That's November, sorry, November 5th. Yeah. Good. So almost late October, but early November this year. Uh, all right. Uh, here's a here's a question from uh, Joe Lardy. I know this is not uh, directly related to foreign trade. But is there any chance that the WASD will ever break apart feed and residual on the corn balance sheet? That category always seems to be a mystery and splitting them would give users more clarity. Um, and I'll let Mike weigh in on this, but uh, you know, I think that the short answer is that that's, uh, you know, it, it, it would be easy to do if there were data do, to do it, but uh, that, you know, uh, Feed use in corn is a is a uh, just a uh, it, 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 it's a complicated variable and and there's a lot of uncertainty there and and we don't have good information on it. But Mike, uh, go ahead and share your thoughts. I guess nothing really additional to add to that other than um, keep in mind if you believe that the the data that we have for the United States is the best in the world, which I would believe that before we would even attempt to do it for other countries, we'd want to be able to do it for the U.S. And currently as it stands, that's not possible. Um, it might be a question for NAS in terms of additional survey work, what they would need to do to be able to facilitate that. Uh, but in the, as, as it stands right now with the data at our disposal, I don't, that's not possible to do. That's right. Good. Thanks, Mike. Um, Okay, Patrick, this one uh, might be for you. Uh, does FAS have any insightful reports or indicators for growing beef demand in Asian countries, specifically China and South Korea? Um, yes, I, I'm not sure whether the, um, the, um, the person asking the question here, Ali, is familiar, but uh, we have attache reports um, coming in from most of the major markets for major commodities and um, 
pretty certain that um, we would get a livestock report, um, attache report from um, China and South Korea. Uh, in addition to that, we have our quarterly uh, world markets and trade uh, report for uh, livestock and poultry, uh, which would have, I guess, the latest information um, that we're aware of um, and also reflecting uh, the global supply and demand numbers that are um, discussed uh, through the WASD process with the World Board. So, um, you know, our circulars, uh, as well as our attache reports would be what I would point to. Um, but I will pause and see if, um, if Lindsay has any other um, references for, uh, and for I, I guess I should also mention that um, Perhaps ERS has some um, reports or data on, on livestock that might be relevant, but <clears throat> I'm not sure. Uh, Lindsay, do you want to add anything? Sure. Um, both Korea and Beijing put out a livestock report twice a year. So um, the annual reports were just submitted in September, August, September timeframe, and we'll get a mid year report from them in March. So, so these reports summarize the you know, current current de demand, um, current market conditions, and talk about next year. They don't talk a lot about long-term demand, um, long-term changes in the market. So um, ERS has done some of that work. So I would urge you to check out GAIN to see what's coming in um, beyond just the normal livestock reports. They also um, submit reports from, from posts throughout the year on different, different topics. So um, that's probably your best source. Um, and then uh, to ERS might have some additional publications that, that take a look at uh, longer term trends. All right, thanks, Lindsay. Um, all right, so uh, uh, we're back to no open questions. So, oh, okay, hold on, here's the new one. Um, um, okay, uh, Mike, this might be for you. Uh, attache versus WASD has been very different on coarse grain imports for China. Is there a particular reason for this? Currently, WASD has coarse grain imports of uh, 55.4 uh, million tons, 2021-2022 uh, 20, 20, October, and attache shows 47.5 million tons. These two estimates have not seemed to follow one another lately. What is the reason if there is one? Uh, and, he said, and he clarified coarse plus wheat to be specific. Coarse grains plus wheat. Coarse grains plus wheat. Uh, I'll just say that uh, I think we talk about this a lot, but it's worth reiterating here. Uh, the attache reports are one component of the monthly process, right? So it's a critical component, but it's not the only one. So when we, when we go through, for example, in the coarse cream world, we're taking a look at the entire supply and demand balance for the rest of the world as well, right? And how China fits in with that. So for example, in coarse grains, uh, differences could occur between what, what the attache expects for barley versus what we expect. And that actually would be expected given that Perhaps they don't look as closely at what's going on in other parts of the world, uh, Ukraine, for example, or Europe uh, as another another case, or what's happening with sorghum. So um, obviously China has been an enigma on the grain side and it's just emerged as a large coarse grain importer. So I would say that those differences would actually be expected because I think depending on who you talk to, you also get different opinions in, amongst private analysts. So uh, not, not uh, unusual to have a difference there. Uh, at least early on in the forecasting cycle for a year. Good. Thanks, Mike. All right, another question. Uh, when it comes to foreign production, the WASD report seemed to lag reality. Example, the corn production numbers from Brazil. The trade knew the crop was smaller, but it seemed that it took the USDA a few months to catch up a big 5.5 million ton drop from June to July uh, WASD on Brazil corn. Are we relying on CONAB or our attache to help us along 
or why the lag? Uh, Mike, any uh, thoughts so on that? So I would say, good, good question. First, first point I would make is we generally, and Keith, feel free to jump in here, but we generally follow and in the case of corn and the coarse grains, and then on the oil feed side, we follow Kanab uh, as a guide. They're not the uh, only entity that puts out a, a numbers as far as Brazil goes, as everyone in this uh, in here knows. Um, I guess part of the challenge with Brazil is, uh, in terms of especially as, as Safrina is concerned, um, the last few years, and in particular this year, uh, the, the, the dry weather that occurred in the south in combination with the how the rainy season fared out. Um, we do our best to try to be out in front of uh, numbers in terms of uh, where we think our best judgment of where they're going to be when it's all said and done. Um, yes, the trade may have been out in front of that one, but I'm old enough to remember 1920 when the trade thought the U.S. corn yield was going to be 160, and it wasn't. So... Not to say the trade gets it wrong or right, it's just that there's a lot of opinions out there and we do our best to balance all of the available information in any given month. And uh, so take that for what it's worth. Uh, that's not to say that we're not without improvement. We certainly look at our methods and look at how each forecasting cycle goes and try to improve in the next cycle. So appreciate the question. Very good, thanks Mike. Um, all right, so uh, we're back to waiting for your questions. Uh, just note that it uh, seems like Joe DeCampo is getting off real easy. Well, how about some uh, census questions, anyone? Um, Joe? Uh, uh, if not, we'll uh, give, you, give you all another few minutes to, uh, to uh, think of any, if you, um, if you have anything on your mind. I'm sorry, Mark. You said Joe DeCampo was getting what? Getting off easy this session. No questions for census. Oh, <laughs> uh, this audience loves you guys, not me. <laughs> well, let's see. Going once. Um, Going twice. Uh, okay, one more just came in here. Um, piggybacking on the best available information, are the estimates for if the market year ended now or if the market year returns to normal or, quote, continues along the most likely path? I'm thinking of the derecho last year or the Brazil's corn referenced and the North Dakota and Canadian drought. Um, um, Mike or Keith, you guys want to share some thoughts on that? I'm not sure I follow if I'm interpreting that correctly. Are you, are you asking, so you have weather to date plus weather going forward, right? We assume normal weather going forward. So, um, uh, When you say, quote, continues along the most likely path, are you implying that we would use persistence for weather? We wouldn't forecast weather. So you have weather to date. Uh, I guess the North Dakota Canadian drought would be an example. You have weather to date and weather going forward. We wouldn't forecast weather going forward. We just assume normal weather. Keith, feel free to jump in here if you, if I feel, if you feel like I'm wandering in the wilderness. Um, yeah, I have a little bit of a strong opinion on how our forecast season went on the Canadian canola crop. And I would just say we were we were late on the uptake, honestly. Um, we had signals and it took us a little longer than it should have. Uh, wasn't anything to do with what we were assuming about weather upcoming. It was just how we were interpreting the signals that we had. A uh, little bit of a mixed bag between on the ground reporting and some of the uh, satellite data that we used. Not anything about assuming weather coming, though. 
Uh, it, it's a little bit complicated, Mike, I think, right, in the case of a drought yep. season, you're kind of in a persistence mode as opposed to normal climate assumed. So um, well, those, those seasons get a little bit more difficult. And the other thing too, Keith, as you know, for some, for some countries where the data allows it, you could very well update your crop estimate a year after the fact. So right. the U.S. corn yield for the 2021 year at, with the September 1 stocks report changed more than the corn yield did for 21-22. And that was, the, that was harvested a long time ago, right? So uh, the other issue temporally is when is it final? Well, it obviously helps to have utilization data where it's available to uh, to use an ask term, the administrative data to, to give you at least a feel for how how close you are in terms of what's reasonable for production, especially in extreme years. So go back to Brazil corn. I, I think one of the other elements would be what is how do the exports fare? I mean, there's a little bit of a difference in opinion on what the exports are going to do this year too. So amongst the private analysts that is, so. Good, all right, thank you guys. Um, uh, let's see, uh, Patrick, you wanna take the next one? Uh, what is the difference between a calendar year and marketing year in the FAS, PS, and D data? Uh, do I wanna take that one? Um, it's, a, it's probably a confusing uh, question there uh, or confusing answer, but um, anyway, why don't I make a couple of comments and then maybe pass it off to some of my experts who have been in the PSD system more recently than, than myself. Um, but, um, you know, each commodity has either, you know, a mark, a mark, an established marketing year um, for that would apply to all countries or a marketing year that would apply to individual companies, uh, countries around when the crop is harvested and, and when most of the marketing occurs. Uh, for some of the commodities in ps and that year might be, uh, I mean, we might be using a calendar year as standard for livestock, for example, because, you know, the production happens all year round. Whereas uh, for some of the seasonal commodities, um, you know, you have a sort of a seasonal planting and harvest of the crop and then marketing of that crop. Um, so, uh, and it varies uh, in the database, um, which marketing years apply to which commodities, depending on, you know, the specifics of each of those. Um, so, uh, and then, um, yeah, I think I'll probably stop there and see if any of the experts um, on the call want to chime in anymore. Patrick, you might just note that we do have on the FAS website definitions of all the marketing years for all the crops by country. Uh, thanks, Keith. Uh, you're right. Uh, there is there's a lot of documentation in the ps and system that basically explains all of those terms. Um, so uh, if, if you want to go there and, and look, uh, you'll find all of the, the specifics. All right, great, thank you. Um, let's see, next question uh, looks like it's uh, really for NAS. I don't know if we have anyone from NAS on the line, if Lance is, is on, and, and if he is on, if he's able to speak as, as a panelist. I'm just uh, read the question uh, and uh, we'll see. So it says, it looks like the USDA is interviewing less farm operators year over year. In 2014, there were 13,300 surveyed, and in 2021, there was only 8,900 surveys. I'm curious if there is a reason behind the trend to be less, reason behind the trend toward less and less surveys every year. Um, again, that's Lance is not listed. Uh, Mark, Lance is not listed as a panelist. But perhaps if he wanted to try to answer, he could actually just ask a question right there. 
looking yeah, at. Yeah, right or maybe answering the chat. Um, and uh, and I'd also say there. That, he's there. His glance is there. They, they there. just. Can you guys hear me? Not, yeah, we can. All right. Yeah, yeah they, they they promoted you. Huh? Yeah, I just got uh, switched over to a panelist. Um, <laughs> while that was happening, I lost connection. Uh, while the switch was being made, but I believe the question was about some of our sample sizes declining. Is that correct? Yeah, let me, I'll read it to you again real quick. So uh, basically in 2014, there were 13,300 surveyed. I'm not sure exactly which uh, re uh, report he's referring to here, but 2014, 13,300 surveyed. And in 2021, there were only 8,900 surveys. I'm curious if there is a reason behind the trend toward less and less surveys each year. Yeah, and, and I would say there's, and what they're referring to based on those counts is our monthly yield surveys that we do. Um, I can pretty much tell by the sample sizes where that falls. And there's really, I guess, three different factors I would touch on. First of all, um, we have obviously over the course of the last number of years, we have seen some reductions um, in sample sizes due to simply cost. Uh, you know, budgets don't grow, they shrink. And so as a result, in some cases, we've had to pull back some, some uh, sample sizes to keep costs down. Um, another factor that can come into play is we've made some improvements over the years in uh, how we draw our samples and how we uh, select people. We've gained some efficiencies in that department, and therefore we've been able uh, to reduce sample sizes in some cases and still maintain uh, the level of quality that we need to. One of the things that we do with all of our sampling work uh, is we have uh, target CVs that we shoot for on our major uh, items. And so we evaluate every year. And if it looks like uh, we can decrease samples and still maintain those target level CVs, then we'll do that. In some cases, we have to increase. Uh, most of the time, it's just an allocation of those samples across the states. You won't see big changes nationally. And then the last thing I'll mention is specifically this year, uh, we've seen some drops in the monthly yield sample sizes, uh, even compared to last year. And this year in particular, it really stems back to June. We actually had a lower response back in our June surveys that we did, our June acreage surveys um, that we do every year. And that survey serves as basically a screener for these monthly yield follow-on surveys that we do August through November. Um, and because of some of the response issues that we had in June, it actually reduced the pool of folks that we had available for the yield surveys August through November. Uh, now, based on that, we're going to uh, go back and, and look at our procedures for that next season uh, to see if there's uh, something we need to do maybe to expand that pool in the June uh, survey so that if we encounter a similar problem moving forward, that it wouldn't have such a big impact on our monthly samples uh, August through November. All right. Thanks, Lance. And I don't know if you can see the Q&A, but a follow on question from Jerry Goodell, uh, the decline in the field sample, the uh, decline in the field samples has also occurred. Is that for the same reason question? Well, it, I mean, to some extent, yeah, it was largely cost driven, but that was several years ago when we kind of made some of those cuts in our objective yield sample sizes. Uh, actually, over the last couple of years, we've been stable and in some cases increased. Um, the biggest change that we really made on the objective yield, though, was uh, for corn, soybeans, and cotton, delaying the, the beginning of that from August to September. Uh, but sample size-wise, um, again, as I mentioned before, uh, the counts that we've got now allow us to maintain the same level of statistical uh, reliability that we, that we need to. Um, and so we try to be as efficient as we can and not sample more than we have to. Uh, we're very content with the uh, objective yield sample sizes that we've got at this point. All right, great. Thank you, Lance. Um, Patrick, uh, you want to grab this uh, next question? It, it's, uh, will there be readme documentation available that defines the columns in the FAS, PS, and D database? Uh, yes. Um, we do have documentation um, uh, on the PS and D system in general that defines a lot of the terms um, that are there. I, I just pasted a link uh, in the chat. 
Um, the documentation is under the FAQs. Uh, so um, if you kind of tool around in the PSD online system a little bit, you'll find it. But uh, I did put the chat there. I put the link in the chat to the FAQs. Perfect. Thanks, Patrick. Um, and uh, final uh, quick uh, follow up from Jerry Goodell again. Uh, for Lance just says 10,000 to less than 5,000 seems too harsh. It, I suspect he's referring to the objective yield sample counts and he's probably comparing uh, August counts from years back uh, to September counts now. And you have to remember that the August counts back then would have included winter wheat as well uh, because that extends into August. And so you can't compare uh, August counts of the past with September counts of the uh, current time frame, so the the drop isn't as drastic as that might imply. All right, great. Um, and all right, believe it or not, we are actually about coming to the end. We're supposed to wrap things up at one fifty five. So, um, just maybe uh, another question, question or two, if we have them. I see one just came in. Uh, I have a question with overall data sets. For the true value of ag variables, how are the PS and D data, how are the PS and D data different from the NAS data? Um, Patrick, do you want to say anything about that? It, 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 Derek, I'll just note that, I mean, the NAS data is U.S., um, you know, official U.S. Um, data, official, you know, U.S. estimates, and PSND is global, um, and, uh, and, it, and it's going to draw from the U.S. data as well. Um, so, it's, uh, the, you know, they're, they're both official, but, um, you know, one for international and one for U.S., uh, Keith, Mike, you guys want to add, add anything? Well, Mike, you'd probably agree. NAS data is sur survey based. Most of the rest of our data is not, doesn't reach quite the same standard as the NAS data. That'd probably be the main difference. I'm looking at the question again for the true value of ag variables. Um, yeah, it's a little hard to. Yeah. yeah. NAS sure. is without Lance. Uh, oh, here's one for you. I think you guys are the gold standard. I've said this many times before. NAS is the gold standard for public ag statistics worldwide. No question, hands down. It's not debatable in my view. So there are degrees, right? So beyond when you step beyond what NAS does and the survey work they do for the U.S., uh, some countries are comparable and then it falls off sharply. So. The PS and D is the aggregate of US plus the rest of the world, right? You have all of it at your disposal. I, I would say too, before I wander off too much, that uh, US data by commodity, it varies. But for example, in the case of corn, the production number is a NAS production number. The ending stock number is a NAS ending, surveyed ending stock number, right? So um, the NAS data for corn appears in the PS and D for the US, right? And then we, combined with the rest of the world, assuming that I'm understanding your question correctly, which perhaps I'm not, but. Good, all right. I think that's good. All right, yep, it said yes, exactly what I wanted to know, exactly what I wanted to ask, so good. Um, and I think with that, uh, we should probably bring this to a close. It's 154. We're supposed to shut down promptly at 155 to give people time to um, uh, move to the next breakout sessions that start at 205, so just 10 minutes from now. Um, so uh, with that, I, uh, I'd like to thank you all for, for attending and, and for all of your good questions and hope that we we're able to uh, shed some light on, on some of the things you were wondering about. And um, again, appreciate your uh, participation. Uh, thanks also to all of the panelists um, and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of data users. Thanks. All right. Thanks everybody. <laughs>